Hello again, everyone, and welcome to this edition of Scripture Verse by Verse. <clears throat> My name is Michael Moret. Today we're in the Gospel of Matthew, chapter 9, and we resume our study in verse 32. So get your Bible, <clears throat> if you can. Open it up to Matthew, chapter 9. We'll begin in just a minute. I do want to remind you that the Scripture Verse by Verse website is found at the BibleVerseByVerse.com and that you can study the Bible all the way from Genesis through Revelation, if you choose to. And you can do that three complete times, because there's three series there. Or you can study any book of the Bible you want at any time, at your pace, at your convenience, using my audio Bible messages, <clears throat> and that's found, again, at the Bible, verse by verse dot com. Well, we're in Matthew 9, verse 32. Let's pray. And Father, we ask that you would sanctify us by your truth. Your word is truth. In Jesus' name, amen. <clears throat> Verse 32. As they went out, behold, they brought to him a dumb man possessed with a devil. You know what really stood out to me here? Is that the people who brought this demon-possessed man are not named. When speaking of people who brought others to Christ with a need, Scripture often refers to them as they or them or some people. <clears throat> like here. I mean, these were good-hearted people. These were caring people. It wasn't easy to deliver a man who was possessed of a devil to Jesus. I mean, that's a tough job. That's a very unpleasant job. You know, I mean, they, one, of the, one of the characteristics of a demon-possessed person is superhuman strength and just out of control. This was not easy. And they're not named. <laughs> um. It does illustrate a point for us, though. Most of the time, when you and I, as Christians, do good deeds for God's glory, no one ever finds out about it. Isn't that true? But that's okay. God knows, and that's the most important thing. Verse 33, And when the devil was cast out, the dumb spoke, and the multitudes marveled, saying, it was never so seen in Israel. They, people had never seen anything like this. You know what? <clears throat> Those three years, three plus years, that Jesus was on earth ministering, far and away, the greatest years in all of the history of mankind, in all of time, those three plus years were the greatest because God himself was here acting like God. Huh. What a wonderful time to live. And the apostles and the disciples, how great was it for them to see God in the flesh. Such wonderful things. Never, ever has anything been seen like this, was the testimony. Of course not. Jesus gave speech to the speechless, hearing to the deaf, sight to the blind, health to the unhealthy. He even raised people from the dead. Nothing like this had ever happened in the history of the world. Nothing. Verse 34. But the Pharisees said, He casteth out demons through the prince of the devils. He, he cast out demons through the prince of the demons, which would be Satan. Well, that's a brilliant conclusion, isn't it? <laughs> the enemies of Christ couldn't deny his miracles. They were, they were too obvious. So they attacked him personally. Don't be surprised if people who reject the word of God that you believe and live resort to slander, 
You know, when people cannot disprove the truth, they often slander the person who speaks it. Verse 35, And Jesus went about all the cities and villages, teaching in their synagogues and preaching the gospel of the kingdom, in healing every sickness and every disease among the people. Jesus, not, Jesus announced that he was the Messiah. <clears throat> he told people that he was the Messiah. He claimed to be God. He also told people that the kingdom of God could be theirs if they would repent and follow him. Take up their cross and follow him. And then they could be his disciple. And then Jesus did miracles to show that his words were not just the boastful words of a religious fraud. The Old Testament predicted that miracles would accompany the Messiah. And Jesus made sure that they did. 36. <clears throat> but when he saw the multitudes, he was moved with compassion on them because they were faint and were scattered abroad as sheep, having no shepherd. Jesus looked around. He felt sorry for the people. He cared so much about people. Obviously, <clears throat> if he didn't, he would not have confined himself to a human body, given up omnipresence. He never would have came to earth to die on a cross to pay for our sins if he didn't care about people. But here we see another illustration of it. He felt so bad for them. The people were not getting the guidance they needed, spiritually speaking, from the religious leaders, for those that God had put in charge <clears throat> of his people. Spiritually speaking, they weren't getting any guidance. They were getting religious rules, but not the pure word of God. And consequently, the people were confused. The people were living without God. The people were dying without God. Immortal souls were at stake here. <clears throat> and Jesus felt sorry for them, which is why he gave them the word of God. If a preacher, if a pastor entertains tries to be cute, tries to be funny. If a preacher, if a pastor tries to impress the people with his great intellect by saying words that nobody understands or constantly saying, you know, in the original, he's never seen the originals. Nobody has. In the original, this, this let me correct the Bible. And go ahead and do it. Feel free to do it if you're using one of the modern translations because they're all a bunch of garbage anyway. <clears throat> they're not even based on the right text. Anyway, I always get off on that. But if they don't, my point is, if they don't teach the Word of God, they don't care about you. They don't care about the people. If they do one of the other things that I mentioned, they don't care about you. They care about themselves. They're trying to impress you or something. But they don't care about the people or they'd be giving out the pure word of God, whether the people wanted it or not. Jesus gave out the word of God because he felt sorry for the people. He had a genuine concern for them. <clears throat> Verse 37, Then saith he unto his disciples, The harvest truly is plenteous, but the laborers are few, and nothing has changed much. The spiritual needs of the world are much greater than the Christian workforce that God can count on. Take it one step further. The spiritual needs of God's people, Christians, is much greater than the Christian workforce that God can count on. For the, for the reasons previously mentioned, because so many people are in the ministry, so-called, to draw attention to themselves or to get a big following or to build a church or some such thing. But here's a prayer request from Jesus. You, th you think it's not important to him that, that 
that there be people who proclaim the pure word of God? You know, we, we have a lot of prayer requests for Jesus, don't we? But how about this? This is a switch. He has a prayer request for us. Pray, the Lord of the harvest, that he would send laborers into the field. There's such a need for the word of God to be proclaimed. I pray this every prayer. I pray this prayer every morning. I figure I, you know, I pray for so many things to Jesus. I have so many requests for him. I ought to take the one prayer request that he has for us and pray it. So every every morning I say, Father, Jesus asked me to pray that you would raise up preachers, godly men, who will proclaim your word without compromise. And I pray that you do. And I also volunteer to be one. That's a good thing to pray. Verse 38. <clears throat> pray ye therefore the Lord of the harvest that he will send forth laborers into his harvest. So Jesus didn't say, hey, don't waste your time praying. There's so much that needs to be done. You need to do something real. I mean, you, you need to get busy. You need to do something real. He didn't say that because praying is doing. Praying is a part of doing. And when we pray, God works through his providence to open doors of opportunity to do other things as well. Let's go into chapter 10. <clears throat> and when he had called unto him his 12 disciples, he gave them power against unclean spirits to cast them out and to heal all manner of sickness and all manner of disease. Now, many people in scripture had done miracles by the power of God, Old Testament and New. But none of those people could give other people to do mir the power to do miracles like Jesus did. Isn't that, isn't that something? How about that for amazing power? How about that for a display of the power of God? Now, I love to teach. I've, I've always loved to teach from the time I'm, I was old enough to remember anything. I, I, I used to teach people on, on, on the block where I grew up how to ride a two-wheel bike. As soon as I learned how to ride a bike, I immediately started teaching other little kids who were younger than me how to ride a bike. I, got so, I just love to teach. If I know something, I want to teach it. <clears throat> but it takes work. When I learned how to ride a bicycle, I could not simply say, there were three little girls that I, that I taught how to ride a bike. But I couldn't just say, hey, I give you the power to ride your bike. Now get on and on and ride. I had to teach them. See, but Jesus, he didn't even have to, well, he taught, but here he gives his disciples the power to do what he did. How would you like to be a coach of a baseball team or a football team, a great player who is now a coach and just be able to say, here, I impart to you all the skills that I had as a player. Wouldn't that be nice? He gave people the power to do miracles like he did. His followers, his twelve. So when Jesus tells his people to do something, even today, he gives his people the power to do it also. He never will tell you to do something <clears throat> and not equip you through the power of the Holy Spirit to be able to do it. Two. Now the names of the twelve apostles are these. The first, Simon, who is called Peter, and Andrew, his brother, James, the son of Zebedee, and John, his brother, Philip and Bartholomew, Thomas and Matthew, the tax collector, James, the son of Alphaeus, and Labias, whose surname was Thaddeus, Simon, the Canaanite, and Judas Iscariot, who also betrayed him. Now, we don't know much about the apostles, and that's fine because the work they did for Jesus was more important than they themselves. Christians are not on earth to draw attention to themselves or to get recognition for themselves, but to do what Jesus tells them to do and draw attention to Jesus, to get out the word. That's why we're here, not to make a name for ourselves, not to have people look at us and say, hey, isn't he wonderful? 
Isn't she wonderful? No, it's, it's not wrong to be recognized as long as that's not your goal in life. Verse 5. <clears throat> These twelve Jesus sent forth and commanded them, saying, Go not into the way of the Gentiles, and into any city of the Samaritans enter not, but go rather to the lost sheep of the house of Israel. The Jews, the, the Israelites, they were promised a Messiah in the scriptures. And the first order of business for Jesus' new preachers will be to announce to the Israelites that the scriptures are being fulfilled. Messiah is here. Just as scripture said, Jesus is the Messiah, first order of business. So that's why Jesus gave them, give them, gave them these specific marching orders. Verse 7, And as ye go, preach, saying, The kingdom of heaven is at hand. The, uh, the Israelites were, were to be told that the Messiah was here and that the kingdom of heaven was knocking at the door. The Messiah is here and they could follow him. You know, they were being fed, as I mentioned earlier, a lot of man-made rules and lies by the religious leaders. Consequently, the people were confused. But they don't have to be confused anymore. The people can now follow God and live for God the correct way through Jesus Christ and the word of God that he's proclaiming, that John the Baptist had proclaimed, and that the apostles are proclaiming. They've got light. They've got direction. They don't have to be in darkness anymore. Quit listening to your religious leaders and start following the word of God. Verse 8. So Jesus says, as you go, verse 7, preach, saying the kingdom of heaven is at hand. <clears throat> That's a pretty amazing message, isn't it? That's a pretty bold message. So he follows it up with verse 8. Heal the sick. Cleanse the lepers, raise the dead, cast out demons. Freely ye have received, freely give. <clears throat> this was a holy calling, <clears throat> not a money-making venture. Jesus said, freely you have received. I've given you this message, the message of God's word of God. You didn't have to buy it. I gave it to you. And you didn't have to buy the power to do miracles. I gave you that too. So you have freely received these things. Now go out and freely give them to other people. You know why? Because they were in the ministry. And that's what ministry is. This was a holy calling. Not a money-making venture. Ministry still is. I'm not saying that, that I take offerings. I ask for offerings every broadcast. Nothing wrong with that. But if you never sent me a red cent... I'd still preach the word. I know it. I've done it in the past. <laughs> many, many times. Many, many years. It's not the best way to go because Jesus says that the laborer is worthy of his pay. And if you're being fed the word of God, the Bible teaches, then you should pay your teacher. You know, preachers and teachers have to eat too. And we have to pay rent. And we have to buy gas. And we have to pay for our cars. And we have to do all that. So we got to go to the doctor. We have bills. Just like everybody else. I think a lot of people don't realize. Some people think that for some reason that a preacher should not be paid. That they should do it for free. Well, if need be, they should do it for free. And Jesus certainly told the apostles at this point to do it for free. On this particularly particular <clears throat> missionary trip, freely you have received, freely give. The things of God are holy. It's okay to take an offering, but the things of God, holy things, the word of God, must not be sold. They must not be marketed. I despise marketing in church. I despise marketing techniques in so-called ministry. I've seen books entitled Marketing Your Ministry Those books ought to be burned. 
marketing your ministry. What trash. No one should, no one should market their ministry. Do the work of the ministry and trust God, if you're faithful, that he'll move people to give and live off whatever they give you. That's the way it's supposed to be. It's a holy calling. These are holy things. No one, no one should market their ministry. No one should sell tickets in order to hear them preach. And yet that happens. Oh, yeah. <clears throat> we had a guy come to town. I'm not going to name his name because I don't want to give him any publicity. But you would recognize him. If you listen to Christian radio, you'd recognize him because he's on a lot of stations. He came to town a few years ago. He was selling tickets. Selling tickets to come in here and preach. I And, and the evangelicals were just buying them up. I... And I spoke out against it. I said, this guy's wrong. And people, people got mad at me. <laughs> I don't care. It's wrong. You're not supposed to sell tickets to have people come and hear you preach. And you're not supposed to sell tickets to have people come and hear you sing Christian music. If you, if you use the word Christian then you better give it out for free and trust that God will bring offerings in for you or get a job and support yourself. But you better not sell tickets to something if you call it a Christian thing. Accept free will offerings? Sure, that's fine. But don't call it Christian if you're charging someone for it. Jesus, watch this, Jesus never instructed the church to sell anything. If you're going to have a bake sale, it better be a bake giveaway and you accept free will offerings. If you're having a chili supper, you better give it away and just accept free will offerings. You say, well, it's not enough to cover. Well, then preach the word of God and those who are hungry for truth will give to your church out of love for Jesus. That's the way it should be done anyway. Verse 9. Provide neither gold, nor silver, nor copper in your purses. In other words, don't worry about your needs being met. Jesus wanted them to learn to trust God to meet their needs as they were busy doing God's work. Verse 10, nor a bag for your money, neither two coats, neither shoes, nor a staff, for the workman is worthy of his food. God will provide for them as they go about doing God's will. God will provide for them. And he would do it through people who appreciated the word of God that they teach. And he still does it that way. Someone will help them. You know why? It's because God's people who really love Jesus, who really love his word, Consider it an honor to help support the true work of God, getting out the word of God. They consider it an honor out of love for Jesus. God's people don't have, a, have to be browbeaten or manipulated or offered false promises of health and wealth if they give. That's, that is just racket. That's a racket. That's, in some cases, extortion. It's certainly always a lie. And it cheapens the word Christian. A good Christian gives what they can give to those who teach the word of God, period. That's the way it is. <clears throat> Verse 11. And into whatever city or town ye shall enter, inquire who in it is worthy, and there abide till ye go from there. Now, more on this subject. In other words, Jesus is saying, if someone wants to help, if you're out there preaching my word, guys, and somebody wants to help, well, then the apostles are to allow those people to do that. If someone says, I appreciate the word of God that you are teaching, come over to my place, I'll give you a cot to sleep on and plenty of oatmeal, plenty of cream of wheat, then the apostles are to accept that. Gratefully. Now, if somebody else comes along and says, hey, 
why don't you stay at my house because I got a queen size mattress and I will feed you steak and potatoes and corn on the cob. Then the apostles are to say, uh, no thanks. I'm staying with a fellow who feeds me oatmeal. In other words, no preacher should appear to be in the ministry to get rich. That's the main point here. That's what Jesus is telling his guys to avoid. 12. And when you come into the house, greet it. And if the house be worthy, let your peace come upon it. If someone helps them, then the apostles are to make sure that they know it's appreciated. Last part of verse 13. <clears throat> but if it be not worthy, let your peace return to you. And whosoever shall not receive you, nor hear your words, when ye depart out of that house or city, shake off the dust of your feet. You say, well, clean your feet before you leave? No, shake the dust off. Shaking off the dust was a practice that everybody understood. They knew the symbolism behind it. Shaking off the dust was a symbolic way of saying, I've told you the truth. I've done my part. When you are punished by God, when you are sent to hell by God on Judgment Day, you're not going to be able to say, I didn't know. Verse 15, Verily I say unto you, it shall be more tolerable for the land of Sodom and Gomorrah in the day of judgment than for that city. There's a price to pay for rejecting the truth, for sinning and not repenting. The more truth a person rejects, the more severe their punishment will be. And some of the hottest places in hell are reserved for churchgoers who actually heard the word of God and never repented and never got serious about Jesus because they love some sin in their life. The hot spots are for them because they knew a lot of truth, but they didn't act on it. And it was the same situation for the people who heard the word of God delivered by the apostles in our Lord's day. It's going to be more of a severe punishment for them than even for Sodom and Gomorrah. And that's saying an awful lot since, if you remember, Sodom and Gomorrah were destroyed by fire and brimstone. So, you know, I'm either the best friend that you have or your worst enemy, I guess. I'm your best friend because I'm giving you out the truth. I'm your best friend if you hear this truth from God's word and you repent and you receive Christ and you start reading the Bible and living for him. It's going to be great for you. You'll have the abundant life if you walk with the Lord. Best life you can have, given your situation in this world and eternity, your best life. So I'm your best friend. If you receive the truth and receive Christ and live the word of God, I'm your worst enemy. If you hear the truth, you understand it, and you reject it and you reject Christ, I'm your worst enemy because I've just turned up the thermostat in hell for you by giving you the truth. Of course, that's on you. That's the way God sees it. Not on me. I'm doing my job. I'm giving out the word. It's up to you to receive it or reject it. But know that if you reject the truth of God's word, you're going to be punished extra hard. Out of time. So continue studying the word of God. Get some more of that truth. Get some more of that light. And if you love Jesus, you want it. You want as much as you can get. Study the Word of God with me at the BibleVerseByVerse.com. Study from Genesis through Revelation using my audio Bible messages. All you got to do is bring your Bible, click, and listen. You're all set. Study from Genesis through Revelation at your pace, at your convenience, using my audio Bible messages at the BibleVerseByVerse.com. While you're there, please remember I am not underwritten by large church or denomination. Just like with the apostles, I give out the word of God for free, but I do ask for your prayers and your financial support if you want to be a part of this ministry. If you want to help me get out the word of God, like the people in our Lord's Day, help the apostles, those who love God's word, I'd appreciate it. Click the donate button at the top of the front page at thebibleversebyverse.com. 
And, of course, prayerfully give as the Lord may lead. Until next time, so long.